I had no idea what the title was, but it was beautiful. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you here this morning. I pray that you are well and that you are looking forward to a time of worship. I want to invite you to join me in reading our life verse for August. It comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse 10. Let's read these words together. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And we are doing good works here in Stockton. You all know we're in the midst of several projects. I just want to remind everyone today is the final day to collect uh, school items for the South Richmond Center. I want to thank everybody who has contributed to that. Paula will be putting all of that work together. She's giving me two thumbs up, so good job, folks. Um, and we're going to get those delivered this week, so thank you all for helping out with that. Uh, we're still collecting items for Crenshaw Elementary, and we're going to collect those things through next Sunday, which is the 30th. Uh, there's a box on the table underneath the clock in the narthex for those items. Um, also, there's a, in the, underneath the giving tree or at the giving tree, uh, we are collecting items for the Chesterfield Food Bank. You'll see lists of all those things um, in your highlights. Uh, if you need a, an extra copy or something like that, just get in touch with me and I'll make sure that we, we get them to you. I want to thank you all so much um, for being faithful as, as we seek to continue to do the work of our church, even though we are limited as to what we can do. Um, Y'all are just doing such an incredible job of uh, helping out with these, with these projects, so thank you very much for that. Reminder of the Fellowship of Deacons, we will hold our August meeting this afternoon at 2 o'clock, and that will be a Zoom meeting. Uh, if you did not receive information on that, again, please check with me, and I'll make sure that you have that um, before you leave today, or give me a call later on, whichever. Um, also, before you leave today, <coughs> bless you. Thank you. Before you leave today, make sure you wish Jimmy Bowling a happy birthday. Today is Jimmy's birthday, so please wish him a happy birthday um, before you leave. I know he's out keeping an eye on the door and stuff right now, but please say something to him uh, before you leave today. Let's go ahead and begin our time of worship with a word of prayer. We praise you this morning, O oh God as we come into your house. We honor you for you are our source of life and encouragement. You sustain us with your love and more importantly with your presence. We ask that you hear us this day as we reverently bow before you. In these and all things we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Morning. Stay seated and humble on to the challenge of the shine and see the lyrics of the faith.
Thank you, guys. Some of you are probably wondering, what do Tony and Victor do when they're not here on Sunday mornings? Well, we're all kind of wondering that, but on the good side, um, I know, Tony, we don't want to remember, remember that thing. Uh, earlier this week, Wednesday or Thursday, one, one day earlier this week, um, Victor did a, a, a one-man show, a concert in the garden behind the Valentine Museum. Um, I'm familiar with it because I, I had the opportunity to do a wedding there a couple of years ago. It's a beautiful setting, absolutely beautiful setting. And unfortunately, I didn't find out about this concert until it was too late, so I wasn't able to go, but it was a lunchtime thing. And is there some place where we can see the whole thing, or was it just that little clip that I saw on your Facebook page? Uh, whoever was there, like, beforehand, um, uh, they, they, like, took little clips. But, I mean, it's, a, it's like every Tuesday and Thursday series, so I, I didn't take any clips myself. So okay. All right. Well, if you get a chance, go, go to Victor's Facebook page. It, it's on there, right? So, I, I guess. I have no idea. They, they report it. I have no idea. I still have no idea. All right. I'll try to find it because it was really fantastic. It was just a short clip, but it was really wonderful. It was, it's just so good to see you. You know, continuing with your music. I know this has been a difficult time for both of you because of the, everything that's going on and you're not able to do your music as much, but that opportunity was just, it was, it was, it was gorgeous. It was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. So. All right, during our time of United Prayer this morning, I'd ask you to please continue to pray for our church, for our church family, um, especially for those who are on our prayer list. I believe I sent everyone a, an updated uh, continuous prayer list this week. Um, it, again, if you didn't get it, please let me know and I'll make sure that I get you a copy of it. Um, there are some uh, there are some new names on there. Uh, these are folks that are just seeking your prayers this week. Um, I've already talked about the upcoming surgeries that we've got going on, so please keep those folks in your prayers. Um, pray for Glennis's family. Uh, this is a bit difficult time for it's really, it was really strange. I didn't find out about um, Glennis's passing until I believe it was Thursday, but we just celebrated her birthday last Sunday. So it was, it was bittersweet, it was definitely bittersweet. So please pray for her family. Um, a lot more school systems are trying to get back together now. They're getting things started this week. Uh, please pray for the staff, for the teachers, for the administrators. For the students, um, things are so much different this year, uh, and they're going to need our prayers, they're going to need our support, so uh, please keep all of those folks uh, in your prayers as they're gearing up for not just a new year, but a whole new, a whole new way of teaching and learning, and just continue to pray for them as well. Um, take a couple of minutes right now in the silence and share with God those things that are on your heart. I know that many of you have blessings to share this morning, but I also know that there are many who have deep concerns as well. Take them to him, because he is our answer. Speak with your heavenly Father, and then listen as he speaks to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Mighty and glorious Father God, your goodness surrounds us like the waters of the ocean. Your mercy pours over us like the sunshine of the day. You have brought order out of chaos. You are forever, forever faithful to your creation. And you offer forgiveness and the promise of new life to all who seek you with their whole hearts. As we gather this morning, our heads bowed in prayer, we beseech you, Lord, to lend an ear to our needs and hear our praises as we lift them to you. 
you, O Lord, are the giver of compassion and mercy. You seek to wash us clean from our sinful ways so that none of your children may perish. We are cleansed and renewed by the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. All that we are and all that we have are because of his love for us. May we be ever mindful that you sent your son as a light for our path and as a beacon of never failing hope. May we be able to endure our daily trials because of what he endured on our behalf. And may we never be ashamed to bear the name of Christ. Heavenly Father, as you know, our nation is in the midst of so much turmoil right now. Your holy word says that we are to be subject to the governing authorities and, and that there is no authority except from you. Father, we are calling upon you as a nation. We are asking you to break the hardened hearts of our leaders and turn them instead back to you. Father, open their eyes to the, the damage and destruction that their words and, and hatred are causing across our land and make them agents of peace instead. Lord God, we are coming before you and asking you to hear, heal our nation and our world. Forgive our sin and heal our land. We earnestly pray. And here within our, within our church family, great physician, we're asking for your mercy and your healing upon those who are listed on our prayers, prayer list, as well as the ones whose needs are unspoken. We pray for all who are written on our hearts, Lord. We ask you to guide the hands of the surgeons who will be caring for Pat and Katie this week, Lord, and give your gift and compassion and care to all medical personnel who work tirelessly every day to restore wholeness to bodies and to minds. Father, we ask a special prayer this morning for all those who have lost loved ones. Father, we ask you to just cover them with your, with your mercy, cover them with your grace, comfort them in their time of grief, help them to know that you are always with them and that they are never alone. Lord, we look forward to the day when we will all be able to safely gather again here at Stockton Memorial Baptist Church to worship as a family. But until that time, Lord, may we not neglect those who are part of us but are unable to be with us. Remind us each daily to reach out to those who are separated from us by distance but are always with us in spirit. And now we pray, come Holy Spirit, and fill us with the fire of your love. Empower us and urge us on as we draw all the world to you. May we always be persistent in our efforts to be hands and feet and the voice of Jesus to this world, a world that so desperately needs him right now. All these things we ask in the matchless name of our Savior, who taught us to pray like this, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You can stay seated and come along with the trust in the Lord.
think you covered just about everybody. You got brothers and sisters and deacons and preachers. Did I, did I skip somebody? Yourself? Yeah, no, the picture. <laughs> yeah. Who else can we trust in? Who else can we trust in? We have to trust in the Lord. All right, hey, you, you, you're going to get me preaching on something I'm not supposed to be preaching on today, so let's, let's just skip right past that. But just remember, trust in the Lord in all things. Scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke, the 18th chapter. I'll be beginning at the first verse. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And may God add his richest blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen.
Susan and I were talking this morning. Uh, we, we were blessed to have the, the grandchildren with us Friday night and, and yesterday. And uh, I say blessed with a smile on my face because when, I have the, when we have the grandchildren, I have a smile on my face. Amen? And when they go home, I have a smile on my face. Amen? But it's also a time of reflection. I mean, they change so quickly in just a week's time. And, and when you started singing that song this morning, Victor, it, it just reminded me that we are definitely living in some changed times. Well, anyway, Susan asked me the question this morning. We were, we were eating breakfast, and we were kind of reflecting on what we did right this weekend with the boys and what we didn't do as well as we maybe should have. Like, did they have too many cookies or did they stay up too late Friday night? <laughs> they did. But she asked me this morning, do you ever think we will get back to the way we used to be? Not with the grandkids or anything like that, just life in general. Now, I'm sorry, but for me, you know, with my bowl of oatmeal and my juice, that's kind of a heavy question early in the morning. But it really got me thinking, and then when, when Tony and Victor brought us that song, there, there's a change coming. We're, we're living in a change right now. And unless we trust in God to see us through this, we're going to struggle for a long time. So I, I asked her, my, my, my question back to Susan was, well, what, and my question for you, and this has got nothing to do with the sermon, so I apologize, but uh, I, you, know, you guys know me. You know I'm, I'm fairly transparent. Um, I try to be, at least. And, and you know that when something's on my heart, I'm going to share it with you because I don't want to carry the load by myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you to help me with this. So I want you to think about something this week. What am I not doing now that I wish I could do? In other words, what, what is missing from my life this time, in, in most, now what, five months into this pandemic? What, what really, and, and for me what it boiled down to is, what really matters? And how much of what really is important, how much of what really matters am I unable to do because of what's going on in our world right now? Let's just, okay, just file that in the back now and, and let's move on to our lesson for this morning. It's one parable with three lessons. I love Jesus' parables. We're going to do a Bible study at some point on the parables and we're going to look at each one. And, I, and I, I can't tell you how long that study is going to last because some of these parables, like this one this morning, will probably last a lot more than just one lesson. But anyway, so as, as, I'm, as I'm wrapping up this, this brief series that I've been doing this month about prayer, I want to focus on this parable. It doesn't seem to be a parable about prayer, but as we read through it, what it became for me it gives us insight into the importance of being persistent in our prayers. So I want to start by looking at the two main characters in this parable. There's a widow and an unjust judge. In Jesus' time, and, and to a certain degree still today in our time, two of the most vulnerable, vulnerable groups of people in society were orphans and widows. Even though the Old Testament teachings and the Jewish laws made specific references to the, how these two classes of people were to be cared for, these two groups were often overlooked. For example, and this I did not know this until I researched it, orphans were uh, could inherit their father's estate. There's also historic evidence that in many Jewish communities, 
there were orphanages. Now, they may not have been the most wonderful places to be. They may not have been all that pleasant, but at least there was requirements in the law of how these children should be taken care of. There, there, was, there was an importance put on compassion and taking care of these little ones. Widows, on the other hand, were not allowed to receive their deceased spouse's property. So what that meant was if we had a widow, she was dependent on her family. And very often, most of them could not, did not have the resources to care for the widow. In fact, the Old and New Testament contains several stories of destitute women, widows. The other person in the narrative is the judge. Now, when we talk about judges, do not confuse this with the judges, capital J, that you find in the Old Testament. These were people who were appointed by God to lead the people. No, the judges in the New Testament that we're talking about, these were local magistrates, and in most cases, they were self-appointed, or they became judges because of their wealth or their position in the community. It's not that they had a sense of justice, it's just that they had more influence than others. And in this particular case, in the parable that Jesus told, and remember, Jesus told parables to the people so that they could identify with what he was saying. When he talked about fishing, the majority of those, people, those men were fishermen. When he talked about widows and orphans, the people knew what he was talking about. And when he spoke of unjust judges, I imagine a lot in the crowd were nodding their heads because they had had dealings with the injustices. But Jesus emphasized the lack of qualifications of this particular judge by twice referring to him as one who didn't fear God, nor did he care about what the people thought. Now think about it for a minute. In, in, in our times today, in order to be a judge, you, you have to care about people. And you have to rely not just on your own wisdom, but on wisdom that comes from God. But that wasn't the case. He didn't fear God, nor did he care what the people thought. And once Jesus just flat out called him the unjust judge. So needless to say, this poor widow was up against a very difficult and formidable foe. She quickly realized that her only hope was to be persistent in her plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Now, as we know now, she did eventually get her justice. She didn't allow herself to be paralyzed by the odds that were stacked up against her, nor did she simply give up. She didn't get the answer she was seeking because the unjust judge took pity on her or because he felt like her plea was justified. And it certainly wasn't because he wanted to do the right thing. No, it says right here, Jesus tells us, that the unjust judge ruled in the widow's favor because she would not stop bothering him. Through this parable, Jesus teaches us three lessons, and this is what I want to focus on today. Lesson number one, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up. Now, as I was reading through this and as I was writing this down, the question came to me, what have I prayed for or what am I currently praying? And that's why I'm asking you. What are you currently praying for or have you prayed for in the past that you finally just gave up on? I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed and nothing's changed. I'm just going to give up. I read a study, again, because I was looking for an answer, and I read a study and in this study, it said that there were three, or it listed the top three reasons why people stop praying. Number one, we, the one who is praying, have unresolved guilt 
or shame. This usually comes when we have unconfessed sin in our lives, which keeps us from feeling free to open up with God. In other words, we don't feel worthy. Number two is kind of the opposite of number one. The number two reason we tend to stop praying is when we're comfortable, when things are going well, when everything's good. Remember those days? We said we tend to stop praying when life seems to be moving along at a good pace. The problem with this, folks, is that we have to have a disciplined prayer life because if we don't, our prayers will be determined by our emotions, by how I'm feeling today. I'm feeling pretty good. Lord, thank you, and then we're off. Is a lot different than on our knees praying, Lord, I need your help now. We can't allow our emotions di to dictate our prayer life. And then reason number three, we tend to stop praying when we become discouraged or disillusioned. And I believe this, is, this goes to the very heart of today's message. Now, I've talked to you before about there are two equally important aspects of prayer, speaking and listening. Most of us are really good at the first part, but we struggle with the second. We're not as adept as listening to God's response or looking for God's response to our prayers. We send the prayer up, and then we don't listen for the answer. The second lesson Jesus taught in this parable is for us, it's a review. Over the past couple weeks, I've spoken about how important it is to always pray. The Apostle Paul said that we are to pray continuously or we to be in constant prayer. Now, your prayer time is completely up to you and your style of prayer is as unique as you are. But Jesus took it one step further when he said to the people, pray and do not pray give up. Do not become discouraged. Do not become disillusioned. Let's go back to that thing that you've been praying about for a long time and it just doesn't seem like God is answering your prayer. Let me assure you of something right up front. God always answers prayer. He hears every single one of your prayers, and he always answers your prayers. How do I know? Well, I know it because God said he will. I know it because this appears in Scripture time after time after time. Through the prophet Jeremiah, and this is one of my favorites, and I'm sure it is for many of you as well. God spoke and he said to the people, you will call on me and you will come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. That's a promise. I will listen to you. But more importantly, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Our prayers have to be wholehearted. They have to come from deep within us. Peter wrote, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. It comes from the heart, and it comes from a righteous heart, a heart that is right with God, a heart that is, that is connected to God. And then the Apostle John wrote, we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does the Father's will. God does not listen to sinners. He does listen to the godly person who does the Father's will. Are there any in the room that are sinners? Or am I the only one? That doesn't mean that God's not listening to us. It means he listens to us when we get right with him. So many times we, we, we work to get, to get God right with us. We forget that God's the center of the universe, not us. 
We, we can find that righteousness when we are in God's will. This widow had no family to support her. There was no such thing as social security. There was no such thing as pensions. There was no such thing as survivor benefits. Other than to appeal to the unjust judge, she literally did not know what else she could do. So she did the only thing she knew. She dug down deep within herself and with a hard-headedness that matched the hard-heartedness of the judge, the widow refused to give up. She knew she was on shaky ground, but she continued to fight and she continued to be persistent. What has this got to do with us? There's one of the, one of the preachers that I listen to on a pretty regular basis on the radio. Um, I can't remember his name. But what I do remember about him is the fact that in the middle of, or near, somewhere between the middle and the end of every sermon, he stops and he says, Okay, so what's the question? And the entire congregation has learned, and they say, so what? Preacher, everything you've said is all wonderful, and it all comes out of God's word, and we all understand all that. So what? In other words, what does it mean to me? What do we gain from this parable? This unjust woman, this unjust widow was up against, or this widow was up against an unjust judge. I, I don't have a situation like that in my life. How does this parable apply to my life? Folks, you and I are all, the whole world is up against a very formidable foe. A foe that has it at, at his command powers and, and things that are beyond anything that you and I think humanly possible. There, we read in Satan is a prowling lion. He's on the prowl. We are up against a formidable foe. He will use anything in his power to tempt us, to coerce us, to pull us toward him and away from God. That's the foe that we're up against. That's the challenge, that's the unjust judge, if you will, that you and I are up against. But through the power of prayer, as Jesus taught us, we can rebuff Satan's advances. I ran across this, again, as I was researching. This is a poem by, the gentleman, by a gentleman by the name of William Cowper. It's from the late 1700s. I know, I know, that was a long time ago, but listen to these words. He was a very well-known poet and, and a hymn writer. Um, we have several hymns in our hymnal that were written, the words, the lyrics were written by William Cowper. But he wrote these words, listen to this, I'm, I'm part of a poem that he wrote. Prayer makes the darkened cloud withdraw. Prayer climbed the ladder that Jacob saw. Prayer gives exercise to faith and love. Prayer brings every blessing from above. Restraining prayer, we cease to fight. Prayer makes the Christian's armor bright. And Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon their knees. Satan trembles when he sees us on our knees. He trembles when we open our Bibles. And when we pray, he gets real scared. When we pray, not only are we holding off Satan, but we're, we're, standing, we're taking a stand against apathy. We're taking a stand against depression, against hatred, and against hopelessness. When we pray and we give to God those things that are weighing us down, and we allow God, allow God to lift them off of us, we can see the light again. We stay in touch with God, and we're better equipped to receive whatever the Lord wants to give us when our hearts and our minds are clear of all of the stuff that's going on around us. 
Martin Luther, this was another quote that I absolutely loved. Martin Luther, Martin Luther once wrote that we should pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. We should pray our hardest when, when it just seems like we can't do anything. That's when we should be praying our hardest. All right, the third lesson in this parable we find in the rhetorical question that Jesus asks in verse 7 and 8. Will God not bring about justice for his close, chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off, kind of like the unjust judge? I tell you, he will see that you get justice and quickly. And then he asks this question, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This sounds like a, a very negative question, but it's also a challenge for you and me. We have to ask ourselves, are we what I call rainy day prayers? We only turn to God when things are bad. Or are we persistent in our prayers? Even when we, we don't hear an answer or we don't see the answer, are we still persistent? We know that God answers prayers. All right, I'm going to ask you a question. When does God answer? Not, not how, because I've already, we've already talked about that. But when does God answer prayers? Anybody? In his time. The Bible says that. God answers prayers in his time. But remember, Peter wrote these words. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. If we're waiting for him to answer, what if he's answering right now? Those of you that have internet, I want to I make a suggestion to you. When you get a chance, sometime tonight, or maybe tomorrow, sometime when, you, when you're looking for something to help you prepare yourself for a prayer time, I, I want you to go online and I want you to look up a song called Blessings by a lady by the name of Laura Story, S-T-O-R-Y, and listen to the words of that song. She talks about what if our blessings come through raindrops? <laughs> we all know about raindrops, don't we? Amen? Last Sunday this time, some of us were trying to figure out if we were going to take the car to work, or the car to church, or we were going to take the boat. But she says, what if our blessings come through raindrops? What if our healing comes through tears? Listen to the song. We're praying about something and we're looking for an answer down the road, but what if the answer is right in front of us, it's right there? Right there. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Let me repeat the question I asked you first. Is there a time when you gave up on prayer? If there is, let me give you this piece of advice, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but that everyone comes to repentance. We have to remember that those times when we think that God is slow to answer, it's because God is working behind the scenes. He's putting things into place that we don't understand. He's working out his plan for our lives. In this parable, Jesus teaches us three things. Pray always, never give up, and keep the faith. Let's pray together. Holy Father, you, you know us so well. You know that our spirits are willing, but our, 
Our flesh is weak. We want to pray more effectively. We want to pray more often. We want to hear from you. But many times we, we just allow the world to drown you out. Father, we ask that in the days and the weeks and the months and even the years ahead, may your spirit be a daily reminder to us of your presence in our lives. Father, help us to keep, keep the lines of communication between ourselves and you open and cause our hearts to desire to follow your will all of our days. This and all prayers we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his hope, his love, this day and forevermore. May the power of prayer always reign in your heart forever. Amen. Amen.